And I always wonder why filmmakers in this country are a rare species, no? We really, you know, when I started 15 years ago, there were two filmmakers. You know, there was the Beatty Brothers and there was Ashish Chandola. And then 10 years happened, and, and at that time there were only two channels. There was, the, there was the BBC and Survival Anglia. There were just two channels and there were two filmmakers from this country doing that. And then suddenly there was a, you know, there was a big explosion because then uh, Discovery came in, National Geographic came in, BBC started their own wildlife uh, division and then Animal Planet came in. And in India, and there was, a, there was a, a slight boom. From two filmmakers, we got four filmmakers. Okay. And that's been the case all along. You know, we, it's always been just four, three or four filmmakers who then hand over the baton to the rest. And you know, I always question as to why that happens. I mean, I have theories. One is that, no, we don't, as a, as a country, we don't have a a uh, culture of documentary filmmaking. You know, if you look at a television, it's just uh, soaps and uh, film-based stuff. You know, there's no good documentary happening. And without a market, it's impossible for any young talent to you know, come out and start making films. Whereas if you go to Bristol, which is like the filmmaking capital, wildlife filmmaking capital of the world, I mean, there are the number of channels there and the number of companies that, that, that are there and the market that they have really attracts a lot of good talent. So some of, like 80% of the best talent is based out of Bristol. And no, I mean, that is the kind of thing that they have that you can pass on knowledge to and you know, come up with new talent. And we don't have that in this country. But I think that's kind of changing now with you know, more and more, I can see a lot of young filmmakers coming up. I think technology is really helping. You know, it, it's much more accessible to you know, get gear that can produce good films. You have you know, like Premiere and Final Cut Pro all the software that really helps you do stuff at home, which was not the case 10 years ago. So I think we are entering an era of, uh, just as we had the digital photography revolution, we're entering the era of filmmaking. But there's one, uh, one thing to it. Uh, unlike photography, filmmaking is a much more complex uh, endeavor. You know, it, is, uh, it is, first of all, a, it, it's, a team, it's a team effort. There are multiple skills. No, you need to be able to understand the language of filmmaking. You need to understand good cinematography, how to do sound design, editing. So a, a multiple set of skills are required to be a good, good filmmaker. And uh, it's good to know that lots of people are experimenting with it. And uh, hopefully in the next few years and the next decade or so, we will have a good bunch of filmmakers coming and you know, taking over this industry and putting India on the map. No, right now, we are still a very small blimp in it. Uh, this evening, I would like to you know, have this discussion with a bunch of filmmakers, many people from this country. I mean, in fact, everybody's from this country, actually. <laughs> but uh, you know, just when I was lamenting about the fact that you know, we have very few filmmakers in this country, three weeks ago, there was a Facebook post, uh, which I clicked on. It's a film promo. And there was this really amazing series called On the Brink. Okay, and I saw this promo, it's really beautiful. Then I realized it's been done by an all-women crew. I said, wow, that's, that's, that's amazing. You know, to when, when, you're, you're crying. <laughs> when, when, when you're crying that there are not enough filmmakers, these amazing women have got together and brought out a series, and I, I think that is worthy of celebration in this country. Okay, and uh, so I would like to invite the crew of uh, of this of this team and uh, this I mean this team who call themselves the Gaia people. Uh, the first thing I want to know is why they call them that stuff. Okay, but uh, I would like to invite uh, the team that made on the brink onto stage, please. So that's Akansha. Akansha is the director of the film. And this is. This is Sugandhi, who's the cinematographer. Malaika, who's the presenter. And my dear friend, who's the creative head. Aditi Rajagopal, who's the creative, creative writer. Yeah, yeah. So I would also like to invite another very renowned filmmaker from Bangalore, Amog, if he's here. And lest we forget, we have our own dear uh, uh, Kalyan Verma. Please do join us. I'll, I'll be here. <laughs> yeah. 
So I would first like to start with the ladies, if it's okay. Yeah. So yeah, Akansha. Akansha has the most difficult task of you know, putting together a series. You no, know, directing one film is a nightmare. Directing eight is like, you no, know, you'll have, I'm, I'm, she still has hair on her head, which is quite amazing, yeah. So it, uh, how did you come up with this idea of doing this series? Sarah, I've been a filmmaker for about 17 years now. And what I have been doing is what we call the commercial side of wildlife filmmaking. I have done very big productions, largely focusing on big cats, tigers, and they're very commercial, you know, what more can I say? And 15 years, 17 years is a long time, having done, been there, done that. There was this inherent need, I felt, to move away from there and think beyond the tiger and the elephant. My husband here, Praveen, um, he and I were ideating and this idea came up and Malaika was also involved with the initial discussions. And we thought of showcasing wildlife people in this country don't know about, that you know, it exists, go beyond the megafauna. And we came up with a list and it was a massive, massive list. Um, we looked for a funder, that was another story in itself. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's how it came about. The idea was to just move away, showcase animals and talk about conservation. It's never been done before. I mean, it has been done before, but in the recent past, it's not been done. And that was very important for us to be able to tell stories of grassroots level people working in conservation. That is not really been done. And to get it on a network like Discovery, Animal Planet or National Geographic. So yeah, that's how it started. And uh, generally, how was the response from the international market when they had the complete Indian crew? Because usually, uh, from my experience with working with international channels, they absolutely have no problem in having a film shot by you know, foreign cameramen. But when it comes to post-production, they'd love to take it back to their own countries. You know, they really uh, don't trust post-production outside of their, you know, their purview. So, so here we it? made a very smart move. We did not get the international arm of any network involved. We got Discovery India involved. And uh, fortunately, we were able to convince them how important this is to narrate. And they were also looking at reinventing themselves. And it was a brainstorming session that happened and it just emerged that, you know, an Indian production, Indian presenter, which is very, very critical, you know. And uh, yeah. I think we got lucky there. We didn't go into the international market at all. Okay, let's come to the Indian presenter. So, I mean, is, uh, you, you've been doing some presenting for, I think you're, she's a, I think she does a lot, lot of sports, right? And, and she loves horses. Uh, and, most, and how was it to be presenting for, the, I mean, for a series like this, considering that you're taller than most people that you are interviewing? <laughs> so we actually had a big problem with the height. At some point we had to get like a big um, wheel and have someone stand on top of it so that they could actually get a shot because Sugandhi is a little shorter than me as a camera woman. But um, with regard to presenting, um, I spent a lot of my childhood in forests all across India and across the world. And I watched a lot of wildlife documentaries and what I always felt was that there was something missing, you know. You saw this natural world that looked pristine and untouched and there was like so much biodiversity. but when I first started going to these forests, you suddenly saw that there was the loss of biodiversity, there was logging, there was all kinds of wildlife trade. And that's when I began to think about how it's important to tell stories that both marry beautiful visuals like you see in the documentary, along with real on the ground conservation challenges. And for me, the best part about presenting the series has definitely been working with amazing conservationists on the ground. I mean, in every single location that we've been to, we've had wonderful people like we have Tiasa in the room right here who we filmed the fishing gat episode with and these are the people who need the limelight these are the people who are doing the grassroots conservation work so to get to talk to them that was the top of the list for me i mean from through your journey what do you think is the status of the indian wildlife and what do you think well i think that's a very difficult question and there's a lot of nuance in that but um, there are a lot of threats, but at the same time, I've come back from these shoots feeling more hopeful. And I think that a lot of the rest of the crew as well would testify to that. You know, we've come back with a sense of hope because it's not just the 
the words of the people on the ground. We've seen them working for, you know, 15 days at a stretch, seen them um, doing what they would do even when the camera's off. And I think that's what's important, right? So on the whole, um, as a wildlife filmmaker and as a young person of 21, I feel hopeful. Uh, in terms of, the, Akansha, this is for you, in terms of the style of the program, uh, it, I think it is centered around a very young presenter, right? But uh, when I saw the film, it's, uh, it's, I think the style that you've done is more like for, for, for a grown-up and mature audience. Why did you choose to go that way rather than doing it something where she goes on with the selfie stick and with animals in it? Okay, now... Yeah, so um, I think that's where my... Uh, my conditioning comes in. I'm working with a crew, uh, which honestly speaking, there's a massive generation gap because they speak a language I don't understand. They all are like below 25 and I'm 37. But uh, we could have done that. I personally felt it was a little or going a little overboard. Our stories are not about going in search of a species and all of that. We're bringing in a little bit of seriousness when we're meeting grassroots level conservationists, showing their work. I mean, everything can't be done on a selfie stick, you know? No, and I yeah, no, no, I mean, no, but yeah, in that, 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 that style. Uh, so yeah, we wanted to be able to bring out that seriousness in the way she talks and you know, the, what we show, so yeah, that way. Aditi. Aditi is an old friend and she... Oh yes, and uh, yes, Aditi also, my, you know, was uh, part of this whole uh, process yeah. of so what, what should uh, can, can, what, what was your thing about writing the series and what did you think? Um, so, can you hear me? No. I can, but yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, I got involved quite early uh, when, so Akanksha needed an, an assistant director and I couldn't do it, so she found another amazing girl, girl yes, woman, not Gunjan, here, Gunjan. Who, yeah, who's not here. So, um, I think what Akanksha and Praveen both wanted was a lot of, um, a lot of grounding in the series. So, I mean, like Sarah was saying, that there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that's not just camera, not just presenting, not just the shoot. So um, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to structure the film because that's kind of a really important part of the process to understand where you want to go from point A to point B and not just kind of show beautiful animals, um, not just beautiful places or, you know, conservation stories. So I think, um, so what I did was help structure, um, you know, bring in ideas, how to, how to show context, how to show um, just how important these stories are. And also, obviously, language and things like that. I don't know. Yeah. So I think the most often question that I get asked is that, uh, do you write the script before you start shooting, or you write it after you finish the shooting? Especially with wildlife, because you don't know what you're going to get. So how do you guys do it? So we did a lot of it before, because um, they, it was a really, am I allowed to say, it was quite a small budget. And it was, um, it, it, they, I, I, hats off that you pulled it off. It was like five days, you know, to do a half an hour episode, which is insane. And so we spent a lot of time beforehand figuring out this is what we need. Um, if we don't get this, we'll do this. A lot of time, you know, in that so that we, and I think even on the shoot, they did barely slept like two, two hours yeah. a night. So um, we had a shooting script and we were going to film a particular animal. We spoke to uh, our researchers, our scientific advisors, and every possible thing about the animal was put into the script. This is what we need to get. Everything, eating, walking, talking, mating, having babies, everything. And we knew that once we get into the location, about 80% of this will not happen, maybe 90% of this will not happen, but we have to be prepared, you know? Because it's an anchor-led uh, show and you want to see the anchor with the animal. Otherwise, I could just like, Go get a you know green screen and do it, but so yeah that was very important. So we went with a lot of material and uh, we got what we got, and I was also also restructured to narrate a story when uh, we got into the edit. Okay, let's move to the the most enviable position that somebody has. You now to be able to shoot eight parts, uh, it's eight parts of a series is like an amazingly it's a dream job for any cameraman or a camera person. Correction, so, yeah. I haven't done eight. I worked on six, so... Okay, fine, that's okay. Six is... Okay. I, I'd, I'd settle for six. <laughs> Still very enviable. So tell me about how, how did it... Uh, how did you enjoy shooting this? Was it, a, was it a nightmare? Was it enjoyable? Was it... Because I think when you transition from being a still photographer to a cinematographer, it is a big jump in terms of the amount of work you have to do, the way you approach it. 
How did, uh, you were doing a lot of stills before, right? Yeah. And then how did the transition happen? How did you enjoy it? Um, I was making, like after doing stills, I moved into making like films working with the Karnataka Forest Department, uh, who are doing work um, on making educational films for children and all that. So that uh, is what I was doing, and I, I am doing with my husband, Rana. But then this opportunity came uh, with the Gaia people, and I'm very thankful to both Akanksha and Praveen, and also Kalyan. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a fantastic experience, because uh, for me also it was the first time to do something presenter-based. Uh, and uh, like Akansha was saying, the, the script is not, it's a script that is there beforehand, but things were changing rapidly, like we weren't prepared for rain mm -hmm. or snow. So it's like things, uh, you don't plan for it, but then Malaika is like all uh, wet in the you know, first scene itself. So you have to plan and change the script accordingly and all that. So that was... That's um, their problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> you just shoot it. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I really liked the way uh, Akanksha was thinking on her feet and uh, really planning for all these things which uh, were uncertain. And uh, for me, it was a fantastic learning experience. And to be shooting with different kinds of cameras, okay. that itself was uh, something Yeah, I nice. think that's one thing that's happened now is, I mean, a few years ago, uh, you, as a wildlife cameraman, you get one camera to shoot from and maybe two lenses, and that's it. And, and life is very simple. You just get, go on there, you put one, uh, you just have one really long zoom, or you change to a wide, that's it. And everything else is standard, and you have tapes. Now you have like 10, 15, 15 different cameras to choose from. Each one is a different format you have to set up. It must be driving you mad, right? <laughs> and and the, all the data wrangling that you have to do every night, come back yeah. and do it. I mean, how did you manage all these things? Uh, Gunjan and I would uh, mostly do the data transfers at night and... Uh, no, uh, mostly Sugandhi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had told them that I would uh, use that data transfer time to do something a little uh, more useful. I would exercise at that time because okay. otherwise you can't carry that weight. And I think uh, in this room there's Pooja Rathod who is whom I envy because I, I think she can do a much better job. She can lift me and the camera also, I think. But <laughs> and me as well, I think. Yeah, I and, I mean, <laughs> she's the only one with a six-pack here in this room, I'm sure. <laughs> so to be able to do all that and not have your back broken after two months of this kind of a schedule. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. And creatively, how do you approach it? Because when you do a series, you need to have a style, right? Because every episode has to look different, but there should be something connecting it. So how did you guys do a visual style for it? Uh, I would again give the credit to Akanksha because she's not just the director, she's, all, she's like the complete visionary mm -hmm. for that. So she has her own uh, style that she brings into uh, every episode. Uh, uh, for example, if we, uh, if we were filming uh, Malaika in a particular way in Arunachal, it would be uh, totally different because in the Fishing Cat episode, we uh, had to do everything at night and I'm, I know that uh, we faced problems in the edit because some things really uh, <laughs> uh, uh, went out of focus and all that. But uh, the style was uh, different based on, like that was more of a foresty feel, but here it was a lot more of West Beng Bengal mm -hmm. and the culture and things like that. So uh, uh, that's where the style changed. Okay, okay we'll move on from a, a team of four people to a one-man team there. Because Amok does everything. He can shoot, he can edit, and he can write, and he can produce his own film. So Amok, where are you in your journey? Um, first of all, like thanks Kalyan and uh, Sarah for uh, sharing a stage with India's first all-women crew. I've been lucky enough to work with Aditi. Actually, Sudhani. I didn't want to. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Moon Moon. And uh, uh, one of the things I want to credit, um, you know, you know, women especially, is they bring a lot of thought diversity in our very monocultured um, sort of, you know, wildlife filmmaking section because you know, wildlife films. The animal doesn't care who's shooting, right? Exactly. But the moment there's, you know, people, I've seen that nobody talks to men. Like, if you go on interview, nobody talks anything. And then Aditi goes, speaks to the boatman, the widow, everything, and gets like a full story. But, so, kudos to that. And um, to answer the question of how do you end up doing all of that, uh, mostly because it's, there's not too much choice. Uh, one thing I see in our field is everyone wants to be a cameraman. And, of course, it's the most... Um, sexy part of the, uh, you know, whole production, but there's also a lot of unsexy things, you know, that happens at the background. I was just telling Kalyan that last one week, everyone's asking where have we been traveling, I've been copying data. <laughs> Five computers copying 50 terabytes of data from one machine to another machine. Something happens, the file goes corrupt, and you have to start over all over. 
And in the middle of all this, the AC went off, right? And imagine five massive computers generating heat in a small 10 by 10 room. So um, the hardest thing I've found uh, to find, uh, you know, uh, crew to work on is scripting, editing, and all of those things. So you end up doing all of those things because you don't have a choice. I mean, it would be great to have you know, people who want to do scripts, people who want to do editing, people who want to do post-production. And uh, of course, now there is a trend that you know, people are coming uh, to take up these roles. But I think for people who say that there's, um, is there room for more people in filmmaking, absolutely there's tons of space, but not just with the camera, right? Because <laughs> camera, ends up being a very small bit because I have seen, like Kalyan was telling me that um, he was in Bristol last month editing some stuff and he said, we had some very average footage but the editor just made it magical, right? And, and there's so much magic that happens right in front of that computer, right? So I think that uh, to me is a very crucial part of the story. Yeah, it's very true. I think the talent base when it comes to filmmaking is like a T. You no, know, you have a, a, the entire base full of cameramen and absolutely nothing in this. Usually it should be a <laughs> inverted pyramid at least. So it's, and it's, and it's, to it's say the future, right, and um, I spend a lot of time with technology, and the future, and I keep telling all of these, uh, all the people I meet, young people, is the number of cameramen are going to reduce drastically. Steadicam operator as a job doesn't exist anymore because you have these small little cranes that anybody can take and go. Drone pilots, not so much, because these new drones, they can do whatever you want, you can just program. Where uh, we will never find a replacement is where the human element is really needed to think through a story and, and to think what kind of a treatment is needed. And, and to all the young people, I really urge that that's where future is, right? There are self-driving cars uh, and AI doctors, so. <laughs> so we just need brainy filmmakers. <laughs> <laughs> Akansha, how did you solve the post-production problem, staying in India? Well, that was a challenge. Um, I've done two films, uh, human interest films, that have been edited in India. And all the wildlife that I have done has always been edited in Bristol. So, obviously, when we, when we were planning this, putting our crew together, A, we wanted women only to um, edit. Uh, become a little bit of a challenge because the few women we got in touch with were not free. Um, I was open to also looking at uh, editors who'd probably done fiction. And uh, we're lucky to find uh, two boys young boys, um, very good editors, and um, interest in, you know, documentary, I wouldn't say wildlife, but interest in documentary, and uh, they brought in a lot of, uh, you know, that editorial flair that's required, and um, because we had gambled, you know, so much in a way with an entirely an entire crew of new people. We said, let's go ahead and try newcomers for edit also. And I'm telling you, it was a great experience. Um, and I can say that now, yes, there are two, <laughs> at least two boys I know of in India who can edit wildlife. And uh, it was a process for them also to learn, you know, understand animal behavior as they were going. So, yeah, it was a little tough initially. I was a little hesitant, but we, you know, they, did, they did very well. Aditi, when you're writing this series, you know, how did you make sure they were all connected? You know, they're very different species, geographically very different. How did you ensure that you know, one led to the next? Um, actually, can I add on to what you were saying before first? Is I think w what we were talking about is that people only come to India for camera people. And what Amog was saying was that um, more people need to do other skills like write and edit and um, think creatively. And I think that when that happens is when more international money will come into our country and, and you know, we can tell our own stories. So I, I would like doubly stress that that's a really important thing for anybody who wants to get into um, films and wildlife films especially. Because what is really frustrating for many of us is that a lot of money comes from the West and so stories that are told in India are from a very Western perspective and that's not a good thing when it comes to us wanting to showcase our own wildlife and we have some incredible wildlife and some incredible stories here that um, I think we need to tell. So yeah, that's my patriotic uh, side. But uh, to your question, I think we kind of had a format that we stuck to. Um, I don't know how to answer that question properly, but we, we had like a structure um, and we saw where each story was kind of going. So each story definitely has its own character and, and the, the species itself kind of um, 
contributes to that, to the flavor of that. But I think the structure has kind of been the same throughout, and so that has given the series a consistency. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think structuring wildlife films is a huge challenge because you, know, you, you don't... I mean, the structure of a story is pretty constant you know, in any format that you take. But how do you fill it up is the critical thing. You know, you, any film is, should start in a certain way. There is the body of the film and an end. But what you, how you fill it up is the biggest challenge with wildlife because you can't really predict it and you never get good endings or never get good beginnings. You really have to manufacture them. I mean, how did you guys manage that? Uh, us, for us, it was, um, what do I say, a bit easy because... Uh, because you're the Gaia team. A, that. Uh, <laughs> B, um, you know, because there were people involved, you know, and uh, they were all happy stories. We were very clear we wanted to end on happy stories. Yes, you show a little bit of the, you know, gloom and doom that's coming, but end on a note of positivity. And that's where the people angle came in. And that is where we've all more or less ended all our films on. Whether she, you know, she starts off with the people, but she goes and sees the animal. Eventually, there's a struggle, but she sees the animal. Or she starts off seeing the animal, but then goes on to understand the in understanding issues that it's facing and the threats and then meets the people. So it was, it was very clear that, you know, we end on a positive note and, um, and end with the people who she's showcasing. Yeah. It, I mean, I, I love the optimism, but is that the truth? Uh, it is. It is. You, I mean, after hope. having having done uh, seven episodes now and the animals we have filmed, there is hope. That's really good to know. So, Malaika, tell me your best and the worst moments of your filming so far. What a Karan Johar question. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think that for me, the, my favorite episode so far was the Slender Loris episode because I'm a true blue Goa girl. Like I've grown up in Goa and then I kind of grudgingly moved to Bangalore when I started working at a production house here as a wildlife researcher. And I never really fell in love with this city. I mean, it's always like an average city to me. And then when we filmed the Slender Loris episode in Bangalore, I got to go into IISC. I got to go to different parts of Bangalore and see these beautiful primates in their natural habitat. And um, that changed things for me and I feel like that's also interesting from an audience perspective because very often we think that if you want to see wildlife you go into Bandavgarh or you go to Corbett or you go to Ranthambore but you can literally just step outside your backyard and see these incredible animals and I think bringing the natural world home closer to people that was the most exciting and the least exciting I think at one point in West Bengal all Every single member of the crew had like 50 leech bites all over us. I think Akanksha had to take antibiotics at some point. We had uh, bed bugs and we had mosquito bites and we just couldn't stop itching ourselves. And we were staying in this little rural village in Amta. And at the end of the day, even though it was difficult and the conditions were tough, it was raining the entire time, we finally managed to see what we were looking for. We managed to see the fishing cat. So there was always that cherry on the top. Yeah, it's fishing cat. I've never seen one, so I'm, I would love to see the episode actually. So, Kandi, let's do some technical talking. So, what are, what were the cameras that you used on this, and uh, I mean, how, how did you wrangle them? We used the Canon C700 as the primary camera, and for the infrared, we used the Canon ME20 FSH, and uh, we also, in one of the episodes, we used the Sony FS7, and we used the Panasonic GH5 for most of the walking shots. And for some of the low light stuff, we also use the Sony A7S II and, of course, the Mavic Pro. Okay. In, t in terms of the choice of cameras, why, I mean, how did you choose? Was it based on sequences, based on the episode? How did you choose cameras? And what, what was the logic behind it? Uh, for most of the wildlife, we used the Canon cameras. Mm -hmm. And um, when we didn't have to do a lot of the walking shots, because some, in some places where the terrain was really uh, bad, like I have fallen. Uh, quite a few times if Akanksha wasn't behind me. So in, in such places, it was easier to use the GH5 uh, with the Zayun. Otherwise, we mostly used the Canon because the, color, uh, the colors in the Canon are really good. So we used uh, uh, that in most of the places. Okay, in terms of setup, I mean, it must have been a nightmare to mix all the footage. Did you have some kind of a setup that you went into or you shot it in the most beautiful way and then they left, left it to the editors to match it? Uh, we use log in hmm. all the okay. cameras, hmm. but the nightmare in uh, color matching, I think Akanksha can answer that because it I was not a in nightmare. It wasn't a nightmare. You were using uh, which software were you using? Uh, Adobe uh, Premiere. Premiere Pro. Okay, you didn't have any issues. Grading, yeah. 
Yeah, the, the issues did come in in uh, the noise reduction in the night scenes, but uh, Praveen was able to handle them very well with uh, a lot of software. Just asked you to keep quiet. Okay. <laughs> he, noise reduction, sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's a bad joke. <laughs> I'm <laughs> uh, in terms of storytelling, no, you, I've seen your films and know you're a really good storyteller. How do you approach a film when, when, it, when it comes to the story part of it? That's actually a very good question. I have some mentors of mine here, of course, from the Karnataka Forest Department, uh, VMR, of course, Luthra sir and Anur Sredi sir. And uh, what I usually do is go with a blank slate because usually we filmmakers have a set idea of how the film has to be. But when you talk to people who are in the field and just absorb whatever you have to absorb, the story starts writing itself. You don't write the story, you just become a medium of transferring that story from that place to the audience, you're just a bridge. And if you can do honesty and justice to the story, India is a land of stories. I mean, with uh, something like JLR Explore, the amount of stories just in Karnataka, maybe a, a few hundred, there's a plethora of stories. So usually when people say, oh, we are, we're running short of stories, it's just that people haven't been paying attention to what is happening around. Uh, even when we did um, the last couple of films, uh, when I was really like sort of hitting a roadblock as to like how do you create a story about a river or how do you create a story about a bird, all that we need to do is sit in silence and observe and the story starts telling. And we as filmmakers have a responsibility to do justice to the story. When I say justice, it's not just about being truthful, but also showing it in a way that the audience can really absorb. Because you've been there in the field for six months or eight months, right? The audience has to get the whole experience in 20 minutes or 15 minutes. So how do you translate that? And so to answer your question, just observing what is happening and being a translation medium really helps. Um, we don't really create you know, so many stories. Like this. So you shoot and you come back and structure the film or you go back, go onto the field with some kind of a structure? So there is a very broad structure like uh, the film we are doing Wild Karnataka, there's a broad structure as to what are the sequences we need and it's almost like um, you have eight, ten boxes. These are the ten boxes that we want to sh shoot and this is how we want to connect but what happens inside the box is something that happens right in the field, right? You want um, the foot flagging frog to kick right and he just won't do it and then after a certain point something else happens three frogs come and start fighting so there's a new story already so you bring that and also you try and see what makes sense to the audience right because one of the things i think we filmmakers suffer from is we are so into the subject that we think you know it's very obvious but it's not very obvious so you have to make sense to the audience in a way that they can connect to the story because they've never been to the uh, field before to some part we structure and, and some of it we just sort of, it's almost like putting in a jigsaw puzzle. You have 10 or 12 pieces and the rest of it, when they fall, you just put it into place. Yeah, that's true. Okay, talking of audience, how has the reaction been to the series? Um, if you go by TRPs, we don't have it yet. Uh, and we've also in the last Forget 10 days. TR. Forget TRPs, it's yeah. just the number of calls that you got, the number of likes you got. Tremendous. And it's more with each and every episode that airs Monday night. Hmm. Um, is she getting a big fan club? Oh, she is. I'm okay. sure she is. <laughs> we haven't actually... You know, this is like the first time we all have met after the shoot got over, like, dressed like this. <laughs> <laughs> so we really... I mean, what does that mean? <laughs> Not jungle clothes or oh, okay. night clothes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a tremendous response and I am so glad that we've been able to reach out to so many people from such a diverse background, you know, the audiences that we're talking about, uh, young children, adults, and uh, 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 people in the field, researchers. I mean, everybody has called. It started with, you know, so many calls at the Red Panda, and now we're in the third episode, uh, Tiger. It's just been going up and up and up by the number of calls, messages, and all of that that comes. And as an all-women crew, I mean, were there advantages or disadvantages? Advantage. Okay. Lots. Okay. Can you tell us some of them? <laughs> um, okay, to be honest, I was very um, hesitant initially. All right. I was like, oh God, will they be able to do it? Will they be able to endure themselves, you know, through all the tough that terrains? And I was also very scared about myself. Uh, will I be able to walk, you know, for all you know, they might be so agile and they'll be up there and I'll be like, yeah, 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 you guys start and I'll join you in about an hour or so. But they've done very well. There are a lot of advantages. Women in the field, when you're together, you're looked at very differently. You know, you're spoken to very differently. Even if there is a tense situation, we were filming in Tumkur, uh, the Slender Loris, and we're a group of three girls, and one of the assistants was a guy, uh, but he was there to help us. And um, 
um, a lot of people up and down the road at around one o'clock at night, and um, suddenly there was this group of 15 uh, men who came, and uh, they stopped and they came and they started talking. And 15 minutes later, it was like, "Ha, chai lekhenge, ye lekhenge," and that's when they opened up and told us that, you know, we actually came here to shoot you guys <laughs> because uh, the last uh, one month there have been kidnappings in this area, and someone told us that there's a lot of uh, activity happening, and we've actually come with our guns. So being a woman helps in that sense. It helps in uh, dealing with people uh, at the ground level, um, you know, and uh, there's just so much of God. Uh, <laughs> um, you, you're more sensitive to situations that arise. And um, say something. <laughs> Yes? Yeah, so, not on the brink, but it's not always an advantage. I was just think when you were talking, I was thinking about once Akanksha and I were on a different shoot in the Chambal, and we mm. were the only two women with maybe three other men on the crew, and we were shooting in like some remote, remote, remote village in UP, where there was barely any electricity, only men around us all the time. And of course, we were a bit oblivious, I think also. I, I was oblivious, you weren't, when we first went in. And, um, and we, we were there to shoot this feast where tw like 2,000 or 3,000 people from all the villages were coming. And this host family that we were living with were feeding them. And it was only men. And it was only men that were telling us to cover ourselves while we were walking around with our cameras. And it was, I mean, I, I, that was a super, super dangerous situation to, to have been in. And I mean, we, we were safe. Yeah. And, you know, we had a car and we could have escaped had something happened. So it's not always rosy, but yeah, on this shoot. In wildlife, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a very interesting experience when we were filming in Jaisalmer. It was actually, I was the only female member of the crew at that point. And we went into this village and we were filming this woman. And um, my teammate Rana at the time started the camera and we were recording and I was asking her a few questions. And then all of a sudden her husband came in and started screaming and we couldn't really understand what he was saying. But then we figured out that he was really upset that we were filming a woman because women are property and women cannot be on camera without the consent of their husband. So um, I started talking and I was like, okay, you know, I'll ask my teammate to go away. I'll press the record button so that we can get this interview done. And he said, well, you're a different kind of woman. You're a different breed of woman. For you guys, it's allowed. So there's this perspective that, you know, women who are in the field doing wildlife filmmaking are different. Um, and then finally he asked me, can I speak to your man? I can't speak to you right now. Can I speak to your man? And I was like, I don't have a man. And he's like, no, I need to speak to your man because we can't have this conversation. So that happened. But I think for the most part, throughout the episode, we've had incredible support. And I mean, right now we're talking about ourselves as an all-woman crew. But when we're in the field, we're just a crew. Yeah, and uh, for the general public, um, I was a mother. She's my daughter, <laughs> you know, so wherever we went, mother-daughter duo, you know, making this film and these are people helping. <laughs> it's lovely. I think I have one closing question. Why Gaia people? Uh, Gaia people, uh, Gaia is a Greek uh, term for Mother Earth and uh, it's close to what we do. And so the Gaia people, the name uh, and it was coined in 2011 when I started this company. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, all of you, for this whole thing. Thank you. Thank you.